I believe the role of marketing has changed dramatically. If you go back two decades ago, basically marketing sounded something like this. All, all the foundations, numerator and denominator of a marketer, but basically your choices, your weapons of choice to reach consumers were television advertising, magazine or newspaper advertising, or direct mail. That was it. So the Internet, which I've affectionately called for years Darwin on Speed, it's the fastest unionization of push and pull on the planet. I can push out and pull back. I can get customer data instantaneously. I can go to France and get a response from France in two nanoseconds. And what's happened is that great pylon or opening to reach consumers has actually caused a couple of massive points of disruption. And the massive points of disruption are that a consumer no longer has to go to a retail store on a particular product to find out what the best product and price is. They can actually, as you know, go online and reach out anywhere, anytime, anyplace, and actually go to communities and ask communities who they trust more than the actual chief marketing officer or the brand itself, what about this product, what about the service, what about the support? So, yeah, obviously it's changed dramatically. Um, the tool set and um, the numerator and denominator and the fabric of value and the DNA of a chief marketing officer and everyone goes with them is completely different. And part of the conundrum is, is that if you're not congeneering, as I said, with all the ambient touch points, if you haven't studied them, if you're not a master in email marketing, if you're not a master in blogging, if you're not a master in social engineering, if you're not a master in television advertising, and you're not a master of being multimodal, knowing that I'm going to spend $3 here and $10 here, and I'm going to get back this return on investment, uh, you're toast. Number one, I would suggest that they're seminal. Seminal meaning originality. Now, I'm quoted as saying creativity and imagination allows you to escape the predictable. And there isn't enough creativity and imagination around selling the product. Now, please don't misunderstand that for being metaphoric. There is a vast majority of companies that are metaphoric, but they're not highly creative to capture your imagination. I'll give you an example. In a television business, I say we don't sell the cold steel of televisions. We sell the dream. The dream to watch the Super Bowl in the living room. The dream to watch the Pirates of the Caribbean and you think that you are actually a pirate. You don't tell anyone. So really, we need to be much more seminal, much more highly original, and use creativity that's relevant and imagination that's relevant. Number two, all you do as a marketer, all you do as a marketer, is service imagination. That's what you do for a living. You service imagination. So any way that you can find the service imagination that matches the person in their place and time, psychographics, geodemographics, geo um, and um, demographics is critically important. So number two would be service the imagination, whether it's a business imagination, whether it's a play imagination, whether it's a mobile imagination, home imagination, once you service imagination, you have a leg up against your competition. Number three, measure, study, knowledge, measure, study, measure, augment, change, discipline, period. What does that mean? There are too many organizations that are not fastidious and dauntless along the speed of the transaction of the product or the service or the offering that's willing to make changes quickly. The example I would suggest is that because the Internet is Darwin on speed, fascist unionization and push and pull, the power of that discipline allows you to change the scope and the deliverables almost on time. Now, I've worked for retail for two and a half years, and I've worked for manufacturing. The fun part about retail is you take a product, you put it up on the website, and you say, here's a hot product, here's the price point, here's the deliverable. Within one hour, you already have research as to whether or not people are buying. Because you look at the traffic, you know, uh, 20,000 people came in and two bought. Whoops, that doesn't match our forecast. Why didn't they buy? Oh, we know why, because there's no special offer with it, or the price is too high, or competitively it's too expensive against the competition. You literally can call the manufacturer and change and augment it like that. So number three was knowledge metrics, measuring, and making a decision to make a change. And number four, which I think is really important, is to never forget 
articulation of demand. You know, our jobs are not to just say, hi, we have this, or hi, look at this metaphor, or hi, look what's new and hot. It's how do you actually articulate demand for the product? And I'll give you an example. You ever been in a shopping mall, and you're walking down the mall, and over in a corner there seems to be a cart, and there's all kinds of people pushing and shoving around the cart, and you see things being thrown around? That's articulation of demand. And you say to yourself, I don't know what's on that cart, but I think I'm going to walk over and take a look because maybe I want to get mine. There isn't enough articulation of demand being propagated by manufacturers, by vendors, by retailers that really have people stop, look, and listen and say, I want to move closer to the last three feet of the sale because I don't know why I must have that product. I'll tell you why they say they don't know why, because it's so relevant, the articulation of demand. The echo marketing is so strong in their eyes and their mind about that product that they fold like a lawn chair and say, I want mine. So articulation of demand is critically important. I think those four um, are really very, very important.